Okay, can everyone hear me okay if I can just um, get maybe a hands up if everyone can hear me? Okay, just wanting to make sure that we are good with the audio if everyone can hear me. Yes, thank you, Kristen. Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to get started on this lovely Wednesday um, afternoon. Hello, and welcome to our Parkinson's Resources of Oregon webinar series. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I am Melissa Greer. I'm from Parkinson's Resources of Oregon. If you are not familiar with our organization, we are a nonprofit based in Portland and with employees in Eugene and Central Oregon as well. And we provide information and support and educational services to people whose lives have been touched by Parkinson's disease. And we do host these online presentations in an effort to make information on a variety of topics available um, through this live interactive video webinar that is free for everyone to access. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to go over a few details. Um, so please feel free to submit your questions throughout the program in the box provided in the browser that's on the left. Um, there have been questions that have been submitted already before the presentation that have been sent to Dr. Quinn, so he will be reviewing those as well. He might be reviewing some of that stuff within the actual presentation, so keep your um, ears and eyes open. And we are going to save some time at the end for other questions um, and try to get through them as much as possible. If you're having any technical challenges, um, please feel free to submit those in the questions box as well. Many of you have kind of um, <coughs> writing me as in the question box. So if there's any issues, that's where you will definitely want to um, um, let me know. And we will be working on those as quickly as possible. Uh, the last thing that I do want to go over is that this will um, be recorded and up on our, our YouTube page. So if there are any issues um, that you're experiencing technical-wise, um, or if you do have friends that were not able to make it today, you can let people know that it will be up on our YouTube page. So I will be handing it over to Dr. Gwen. Today we are talking about preventing cognitive loss in Parkinson's disease, and is the research going to improve treatment? So Dr. Quinn is a neurologist at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, he is the director of Parkin the Parkinson Center at OHSU, and he is also a board member at with Parkinson's Resources of Oregon. Um, so I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Quinn. Great, Melissa. Thanks um, for the introduction, and thanks for inviting me, and, and um, thank you, everybody who's on the line um, listening. Um, I've got a bunch of questions that Melissa sent in uh, earlier, and uh, I'll try to uh, refer to them as I uh, as I go through the, the talk. They uh, a lot of them uh, relate very nicely to what I've already sort of prepared here. Um, there we go. All right. So, um, uh, Melissa, please let me know if the slides are not advancing, or if, if there's trouble seeing or, or hearing, or, or what have you. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the on the um, little chat box there. So this is the uh, overview of what I'm going to try to cover uh, in the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about cognitive changes in Parkinson's disease, talk to you about some things we can recommend in the here and now in terms of uh, preventing cognitive decline, uh, and then move on to the, the topic uh, in the title, which is to, to talk about uh, research, um, what's what's we've already learned from research, and then um, uh, what research is underway and, and what we might um, learn in the near future. So, so to start with cognitive changes in, in Parkinson's disease, uh, you know, this list of symptoms here uh, on the slide where it says classical view of Parkinson's disease, these are sort of the, the cardinal symptoms of the disease. And, and you can see the picture on the right of a person with rigidity and um, a change in posture, change in gait, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, this is what Dr. Parkinson described uh, 200 years ago uh, when he wrote this uh, famous uh, essay, uh, and ultimately the, the disease uh, was named in his honor. And he made a specific point uh, that the intellect was not affected. So that middle bullet point on the slide, 
the absence of any injury to the senses and to the intellect. Uh, he was making the point uh, at that time that cognitive changes are uh, were not thought to be a part of, of uh, uh, Parkinson's disease. But what we've uh, learned in, in recent years, and I think this is in part due to the fact that treatment of the the movement disorder aspect of Parkinson's disease has improved so much and people have survived for a much longer period of time. We've come to realize that thinking changes, cognitive changes, uh, are really a common feature of Parkinson's disease and they can be a, a real source of uh, distress to patients and, and caregivers and, and even a, uh, a source of, of disability. Uh, and there's been more and more systematic uh, evaluation of this uh, problem um, uh, and some of the estimates right now uh, are that even at the time of diagnosis of, of Parkinson's disease, early in the stage, uh, some people do have uh, some, um, some cognitive impairment. Um, we, we use the term mild cognitive impairment to describe a degree of, of thinking problem that falls short of an overt dementia, and then we use the term dementia to describe uh, thinking impairments that are severe enough to interfere with somebody's uh, ability to function day to day. <clears throat> so some recent estimates are that at the time of diagnosis, about 20% of people uh, have mild cognitive impairment even early in the disease course. Uh, and um, if, we, if we look at people at all different stages, uh, more than 50% may have, 50% um, um, uh, of the patients with Parkinson's disease may have cognitive impairment. Um, for more severe problems, it really seems to be a function of the duration of the disease. So, you know, so somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of all people with with Parkinson's disease uh, will have cognitive problems um, at, at this relatively severe range. Um, but it tends to appear later in the course of the disease. So by 15 years into the disease, um, uh, a majority of people, as many as 80 percent in some studies, um, will have a dementia. And, and this really seems to be <clears throat> uh, not just uh, an aging phenomena uh, in that even when you compare Parkinson's disease to people of their own age, the incidence uh, tends to be higher. Um, now, I, I, um, I, I always hesitate when I present this information to, to an audience of patients for fear of creating undue uh, anxiety. Uh, not everybody uh, develops these problems. Some people are spared, uh, and we are working hard to understand the difference uh, in the hopes of sparing uh, more people. But I think it's important for us to, to recognize that this is something that um, uh, is an area that really requires a lot of uh, research and investigation and, and uh, a more effective treatments, and that's what we're going to try to uh, get into. But, you, you know, I didn't want to jump right into the research without making the point that there are some things that we can do uh, in the here and now, some things that we can recommend um, that are really uh, based on, on some sound uh, evidence. So that's what I'd like to talk about uh, next. And one nice way to divide these things uh, is to think about diet uh, and activity and, and medications as, as sort of a three-pronged um, um, plan for any sort of preventive medicine. Um, uh, I actually uh, sort of stole this from a cardiologist who uses that approach, but I, I think it just makes intuitive sense that those are three things that we have some control over and, uh, and that are worth commenting on. So uh, with respect to diet, um, uh, you know, uh, there's a, a truism, this, this statement here on the slide, all the things that we know are bad for your heart turn out to be bad for your brain. Um, that's from one of the leading experts in, in cognitive changes in, in later life, who's from Johns Hopkins. And that um, figure that I spliced out for the slide actually came from a, a monograph from the Centers for Disease Control. So, so this is um, really a very well uh, supported statement. Uh, and with respect to uh, the diet um, recommendations for, for brain health, they are essentially the diet recommendations that most of you are familiar with for heart health. So, uh, so the American Heart Association recommends uh, a diet that I'll um, I describe in a, a, a little more detail in a couple of slides. Uh, and there's a sort of more elaborate version of that diet uh, called the Mediterranean diet. And, and either of these diets um, uh, are, are you know, very appropriate for brain health. There's an abundance of, 
of data now to indicate that these are the things that keep the brain uh, healthy at the dietary level uh, and can help to um, um, not absolutely prevent uh, the possibility of cognitive change, but, but uh, move things in a favorable direction. Um, one of the points that I'm going to make over and over again is that many of these recommendations um, for both heart and brain health are really nicely uh, described on the American Heart Association website. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm circling the, the website here, www.aha.org. Uh, they um, have lots of things on their website, but this program about um, patient-friendly recommendations for, for heart health and brain health is called the Life's Simple Seven Program. And the seven factors in the program uh, are listed along here in these, in these uh, icons. Uh, and eat better is one of them. Uh, and uh, the bullet points down here about fruits and vegetables and fish and all that sort of thing. These are the recommendations for the American Heart Association. As I say, the Mediterranean diet is a little bit more uh, detailed. Uh, I like to recommend the, the website because if, if you uh, go to the website and search on Life Simple 7, this thing will come up and then you can click on these various icons and you can get into um, more detail. And I'll, I'll show you that um, with a couple of other examples uh, in a minute. Uh, before I get off diet, I, I do want to respond to one of the questions here uh, that was forwarded before the talk. Can a ketogenic diet slow cognitive changes? Uh, a ketogenic diet is, is a diet that's been uh, used for other uh, applications in, in uh, medicine. Uh, it's a fairly uh, demanding uh, diet. Um, uh, there is, at present, uh, not compelling evidence for a ketogenic uh, diet in terms of cognitive changes in Parkinson's disease. Although, you know, I should note that um, our colleagues at, at Legacy have recently uh, done a, a preliminary study of ketogenic diet and Parkinson's disease. Uh, those results have not been made public, and in fact, I don't know what the results are yet, but I do know that they've completed that study, so, so there will be some more information coming out about that, and, and as I say, some of our local colleagues are, are interested in that uh, topic, so maybe we'll learn some more soon. So that's, that's the diet category. Now to move on to activity, when people think of activity and, and cognitive changes, uh, they often think of mental exercise as, as the type of activity they need to worry about. Uh, and I'll, I'll comment on that in a minute, but I, I will um, uh, uh, give away my, my uh, bias, which is that physical exercise is probably even more important uh, in terms of, of activities that you can undergo. Uh, mental exercise is, is probably helpful, but I, I have to say I find it challenging uh, to prescribe mental exercise in a meaningful uh, or, or specific way. Uh, when I am recommending uh, that people try to improve their mental exercise, one resource that I will sometimes use are uh, speech pathologists. We often think of speech pathologists as focused primarily on swallowing and on clarity of speech, but there are some speech pathologists that actually uh, specialize in cognitive training and cognitive rehabilitation. So. Um, uh, we have uh, some good people uh, in that area here in Portland, so uh, we try to take advantage of that uh, when we can. Um, for people who prefer sort of do-it-yourself approaches, there are options online. Uh, Lumosity, you see advertised on TV all the time. Uh, there is some reasonable science behind Lumosity, um, so that's not an unreasonable uh, thing to try. Uh, this other website that I put down here, www.sharpbrains.org, that's um, uh, a website that's sort of a, a warehouse of information about uh, cognitive training and cognitive exercises. Uh, and if you're interested in those sorts of things, um, uh, that's another fairly reliable uh, a source to, to look for, for different options. Um, uh, whoops, I'm getting a phone call here. Um, uh, one of the um, downsides of this is uh, I've tried to do these exercises myself and I just find them to be kind of boring. It's hard to stay with them sometimes. I've had other people who, who rave about them and, and, and really like them a lot. Um, so uh, what, what I have really recommended to people um, uh, if, they're, if they're looking for you know, ways to uh, get engaged uh, um, with, with co more cognitive activities, really try to um, uh, look for activities that you're likely to stay with, you know, uh, hobbies, games, learning languages, music, uh, uh, music, uh, things that are really um, uh, stimulating and engaging and that, and that you stick with. Um, uh, again, I, I don't, um, I'm not bad-mouthing these um, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, computerized exercises that are available online. I just, I, I, I worry that they're, they're a lot like uh, treadmills that people buy that sit in their closet and, and never get used. Which, which actually brings me to the second uh, topic of physical exercise. So, so there's an abundance of evidence that, that exercise and, and especially aerobic exercise uh, is good for preventing cognitive decline uh, in general, including in Parkinson's disease. And um, uh, exercise is an important component of the um, uh, American Heart Association uh, recommendations. And here we can be fairly specific. Uh, they uh, recommend a threshold of 150 minutes per week. So that's two and a half hours per week of aerobic exercise. And, and you know that it's aerobic exercise if you have a little bit of trouble carrying on a conversation while you're doing it. So it doesn't have to be running a marathon. It doesn't have to be necessarily shooting for a target heart rate. But um, you, you do want to be uh, pushing yourself uh, a little bit. Um, and uh, this, this text that I've pasted in here, this is all from this um, Life Simple 7 um, uh, component of the American Heart Association website. You click on the Get Active icon, and then it gives you all this. And then uh, if you click uh, on, on uh, one of the other um, uh, uh, items on this web page, it goes even deeper. Uh, it'll tell you about uh, specific recommendations, and it'll even go so far as to give you walking paths uh, in your neighborhood. So, so these are really, um, you know, some wonderful free uh, resources for helping people take charge of these, um, you know, proven uh, approaches to to keeping the brain uh, healthy. So, um, uh, again, I'm a big believer in this and and push this uh, pretty hard. All right, so that's the activity part. Now, uh, medications. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I think the, the audience uh, is probably familiar with the idea that, that uh, dopamine uh, is the neurotransmitter, the brain chemical, which uh, goes awry to produce the movement problems in Parkinson's disease. And I think uh, it's pretty familiar that um, the medications that we use for the movement problems in Parkinson's disease work by boosting levels of, of dopamine in the brain or dopamine activity in the brain. It turns out that the thinking problems with Parkinson's disease uh, don't really respond to those medicines in a favorable way. The, you know, replacing dopamine doesn't fix the thinking problems. It seems to be different parts of the brain and different chemicals in the brain that underlie the thinking problems in the brain. So when we think about medications that are important for cognitive changes in Parkinson's disease. Um, this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but the, the neurotransmitter, uh, that is the, the brain chemical, which is thought to be important for these cognitive changes, is something called acetylcholine, and I'm circling that on your, on your screen here. So acetylcholine is, is a, another tr neurotransmitter distinct from dopamine, uh, and it's, it's got widespread um, uh, activity uh, in the brain. This, this diagram here is, is showing some of that. Uh, and you can see that the arrows are pointing um, to the to the surface of the brain. You know, this is the the cerebral cortex, the thinking centers of the brain, uh, and then there's also a projection to the memory center uh, of the brain. So this system uh, is something that is um, very important to cognitive function uh, in general, but uh, we also know uh, now that it's very important to cognitive function in in Parkinson's disease. And um, when we think about medications, uh, we, um, uh, I think first, with respect to cognitive function, think about medications that uh, are influencing uh, this, this particular uh, chemical, acetylcholine. Uh, in my next couple of slides, I'm going to make some specific points about those medications, but I want to emphasize that there's not a one-size-fits-all uh, program here. Uh, and um, sometimes people need to be on um, uh, medicines that, that uh, uh, interfere with acetylcholine for, for other reasons. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to share with you some, some um, general guidelines about medication use, but I don't want uh, to run the risk of having everyone go to their doctor tomorrow and, and tell them that Dr. Quinn told them to take them off medicine X, Y, and Z. So, so the first thing that we look at is, is whether people are uh, with respect to medications anyway, the first thing we look at is whether people are taking medicines that block that, that brain chemical, medicines that are what we call anticholinergic medicines, block 
the transmitter acetylcholine. The medicines I've listed here are a partial list of, of some of those uh, medications. Um, and the first two are actually sometimes prescribed for some aspects of, of Parkinson's disease. So we, we um, think carefully about whether the, uh, the benefits of those medicines with respect to movement uh, outweighs the risks with respect to cognition. So we, we review these medicines carefully. Uh, some of the other medicines are, are medicines that are um, uh, used for other purposes, uh, but they can, can actually interfere with, with thinking function. So we, we try to uh, get rid of medicines that block the neurotransmitter, uh, acetylcholine, and then we also have medicines that can actually boost levels of the neurotransmitter. And, and um, we would call those procholinergic medicines. Uh, and, and again, in both of these cases, I've emphasized this is if appropriate. This is not a, a blanket recommendation. Uh, this is something that you'd want to discuss with your doctor. But if, if someone is having um, uh, significant changes in their uh, mental abilities uh, in the setting of Parkinson's disease, we do think about uh, using medicines that are procholinergic. Um, uh, one of those uh, medicines has, has specifically been tested uh, in the case of, of Parkinson's disease, and that's um, rivastigmine. The brand name for rivastigmine is, is Exelon. So the FDA has approved that for the treatment of dementia and Parkinson's disease. One of the other medicines is maybe a little more familiar, and that's uh, Dinepazil is the generic name. The brand name there is, is Aricept. Uh, uh, the FDA hasn't recognized the effect of, of uh, uh, Dinepazil because the studies were not um, done in a manner to persuade the FDA. But these drugs both work by a very similar uh, mechanism of action, and the evidence that is available uh, supports denepazil uh, as much as uh, rivastigmine. So, so those are just some, some thoughts about um, uh, medications. One of the questions that came to me was, um, what are the best meds to slow the progression of, of memory loss? And, and uh, so that's uh, a partial answer to those uh, questions. Uh, right now, these medicines are not recommended uh, for people who have no cognitive changes at all. It's, it's really just for people who have um, some level of cognitive change. One of the other questions that was sent in advance was, uh, what is the difference between um, uh, Dinepazil and Namenda as far as slowing cognitive decline? Um, Namenda I did not include in my slides uh, because it works on, on yet another uh, brain chemical. Uh, with Namenda, there's even um, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty modest uh, amount of evidence to support the use of uh, Namenda in Parkinson's disease, but there is a little bit of favorable evidence, and, and I think it's, um, um, it's a reasonable thing um, uh, to consider, uh, uh, but I, I, I don't recommend it uh, routinely. Uh, if I'm going to use a medicine, it's usually one of, one of these two. Um, the problem with these two is ribostigmine and denepazil, that is, uh, is that people tend to, um, or some people have, have problems with their stomach when they're on the medicine. They get diarrhea, they get upset stomach. Uh, Namenda doesn't have that side effect, so that's one relative uh, advantage. Um, so again, I'm, I'm going off topic a little bit to respond to this question, um, but I better get back on task or we'll run out of time here. So, so that's my, my summary about diet and activity uh, and medications. What about other things that we, we can do to, to keep the brain healthy, keep the mind healthy? Uh, and, and again, I, I want to emphasize that this Life Simple 7 uh, includes you know, seven factors that we haven't described in detail. We talked about aerobic exercise, but uh, cholesterol control, blood pressure control, blood sugar control, uh, and the absence of smoking are also uh, things that are good for the brain. Uh, I know I can't see your faces right now, but I can imagine your eyes are rolling that you already know all this stuff, right? You know about uh, all these heart recommendations. Um, but the important thing, uh, I think, with respect to this slide is to realize that even though all of us know that these are the right things to do to keep healthy, including keeping our brain healthy, only 2% of the American population meets these guidelines. So um, we've all got lots of work to do. And, and that's why, even though I know at some level people are aware that these are important, uh, I really continue to uh, hammer them. Uh, again, the website at the American Heart Association has some very user-friendly tools. Uh, to help you uh, approach these things and, and, and optimize them. All right, now how about uh, things beyond uh, Life Simple 7? Well, there's two things that we haven't mentioned that I think are very important 
Uh, one of them is to optimize uh, the quality of sleep. And the other one is to recognize that depression is bad for the brain. So if somebody has depression, and, and depression is not uncommon in Parkinson's disease, you've got to make sure that you, you treat it. So let me, let me say a couple word, more words about sleep. So sleep apnea uh, is one of the uh, uh, problems that we see in, in people who get older. Um, uh, and uh, sleep apnea is actually in, it, associated with an increased risk of stroke. Uh, it's associated with an increased risk of dementia. Uh, and, and then uh, it can also just make people sleepy during the day if you have sleep apnea at night, and that will uh, interfere with your cognitive uh, function. So those are three reasons uh, to um, take sleep uh, very seriously. And if, if you're um, uh, snoring a lot at night, if, you're, if your bed partner notices that you stop breathing briefly at night, uh, or if you just wake up uh, fatigued and don't get rested well at night, uh, thinking about a referral to a sleep specialist is, is very much in order. Uh, this is one of the most um, potent things I think we can do to uh, reduce our risk of cognitive decline uh, over time. Uh, there's also some evidence, uh, this is more in the, in the basic science world right now, uh, there's also some evidence that, that when you get um, good quality sleep, it clears out some of the uh, bad things that accumulate in the brain during the day, uh, including uh, things that may contribute to Parkinson's disease and, and other um, causes of cognitive dysfunction. So, so sleep is very, very important and um, uh, should be optimized if we're trying to uh, retain our cognitive function. Uh, depression uh, is the other one that I mentioned just a second ago, and um, uh, I, I want to make the point that that um, depression really is bad for the brain. What we're seeing here, what I'm circling with my arrow, that's a, a brain cell uh, in the memory center of the brain, and, and these are all the branches coming off of it. And you can see that in a setting of chronic stress, including depression, the branches decline uh, and then if you look at this higher magnification one here on the left, all these little bumps sticking out from the sides, those are synapses. That's what synapses look uh, like under the microscope. And you can see that under chronic stress or chronic depression, the synapses are damaged. So, so this, um, this fact is becoming increasingly clear. Depression is not just uh, a miserable experience, but, but it actually can, can uh, uh, damage the brain over time. So... Um, Treating depression, if it's present, is, is really uh, very important. Uh, on this slide, I, you know, it's obviously, it improves quality of life all by itself, but then sleep and appetite are also affected. And then um, you reduce the risk of, of damage uh, to the brain. All right, so, so now I'm going to move on to uh, some research uh, uh, issues. And I'm gonna start by talking about um, what, what research is telling us uh, uh, in the here and now. So, um, what, what are some of the theories about how uh, Parkinson's disease um, is associated with cognitive decline? What are the um, events that we think uh, promote um, uh, cognitive decline and, and dementia? And, and one of those ideas is that Lewy bodies, uh, which, which many of you know are, are the um, changes in the brain associated with Parkinson's disease, that they spread <clears throat> from the movement areas of the brain out to the thinking areas of the brain. And that's why in the beginning of Parkinson's disease, people have some movement problems, and in the later stages, uh, people have some thinking problems. So this is one of the major theories uh, about uh, why um, cognitive decline is so prevalent in Parkinson's disease. And my, my next slide, I think, will illustrate that a little bit better. Um, so, so this is just to make the point about what, what Lewy bodies are. Um, this uh, picture here is, is what's called the midbrain. It's, a, um, uh, it's just showing the appearance of part of the brain. And this, this black area here, those are the cells that are loaded with dopamine. That's a healthy brain. Here's uh, the same section of brain in a patient with Parkinson's disease. That black area is gone because the dopamine cells are sick. If you look at that area under the microscope, um, what I'm circling right now, this whole thing that I'm circling, that is a brain cell that's making dopamine. Um, all that is normal. This black stuff is normal. But this pink thing, this round pink thing, that is the Lewy body. And that appears in these brain cells, and then the brain cells die. And we think that the, that the Lewy bodies promote the death of these brain cells. 
And by promoting the death of these brain cells, uh, the brain is depleted of dopamine and then people develop these, these movement problems. Um, we, we also now know that these Lewy bodies, these round pink things, are composed of something that is called alpha-synuclein. And that'll become relevant um, uh, in, a, in a few later slides. Uh, this, this slide is shown from left to right, uh, this theory of the progression of Parkinson's disease. So actually the, the middle slide uh, is a person who is basically newly diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And at this point, uh, the Lewy bodies are in the movement centers of the brain right here in the, in the middle. Um, there's a period of time before the person actually has symptoms when there are Lewy bodies in lower parts of the brain. Um, uh, these are people who have sort of uh, prodromes of, of Parkinson's disease, but they're not diagnosable yet. Uh, then as the Lewy bodies progress up here, according to this, this theory, then, then you get the motor problems. And then years after the motor problems, then the Lewy bodies progress to the rest of the brain, to the cortex, to the thinking parts of the brain. Uh, and under this theory, that's what, what causes uh, the cognitive decline in Parkinson's disease. And I keep emphasizing that it's a theory uh, because it is, it is a theory. It's a widely uh, embraced theory, um, but it remains to be seen whether this is uh, the bulk uh, of the story. And there are other stories. You know, this, this, <clears throat> this theory is, is uh, uh, speculating that it's Parkinson's changes per se progressing throughout the brain. But there's some other research suggesting that it's, it's not Parkinson's changes per se, but it's, it's the co-occurrence of Alzheimer type changes. And the particular Alzheimer type change is something called a, a neurofibrillary tangle. And, and, you know, maybe I should emphasize here, I know the talk is getting complicated, but um, we actually have clinical trials that are directed at, at each of these problems right now. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I'm trying to set up um, uh, a description of, of uh, why uh, the clinical studies uh, that are underway are underway. So this, this second theory is the idea that this Alzheimer change um, uh, is, is the uh, microscopic change in the brain that underlies cognitive decline. Uh, and this is um, some research. There were about um, four academic medical centers uh, around the country participating in this. And, um, and what they found was that the, uh, among patients with uh, Parkinson's disease, um, the rate of time that it, that it took for people to develop cognitive problems uh, was faster in people who had a lot of Alzheimer changes in their brain. Uh, and in fact, it was faster in people who had that particular type of Alzheimer change called a, a neurofibrillary uh, tangle. Um, so uh, again, I'm going to come back to that uh, a little later when I talk about the uh, research that's currently underway. The last theory that I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, based on the fact, and this is a relatively recent finding, that there is a gene <clears throat> that... Um, is seen in some people with Parkinson's disease. I should emphasize most cases of Parkinson's disease are not associated with a particular gene. But about 4% of people with Parkinson's disease have a gene called the GBA gene. And that gene uh, is um, uh, associated with a risk of Parkinson's disease. Uh, we knew about that gene, the medical community knew about that gene before uh, it was appreciated to play a role in Parkinson's disease because it was associated with another rare disease called Gaucher's disease. And um, one of the more recent observations about this gene is that it's actually associated uh, with, with cognitive decline in, in Parkinson's disease. So uh, Gaucher's disease is, as I say, a rare disease. Um, these are just some uh, slides explaining that this is a, a very rare disease. It's um, uh, associated with uh, 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 something called a lysosome. Um, it's seen only in one in 40,000 people uh, worldwide. And uh, to get the disease, a person has to have two copies of the bad gene. All right. So, uh, you know, everybody has, has two copies of each gene. And what this figure is showing is that this father here has one bad gene and one good gene. The mother has one bad gene and one good gene. And if by chance, uh, both of the bad genes go to a child, that child will, will end up with this rare disease, this Gaucher's disease. And we've known about, about that for a long time. 
what uh, is relatively newly discovered is, is that people who, who just have one copy of the bad gene, uh, including some of the siblings here or either of these parents, we, we didn't used to think that that was associated with any disease, but if you have one copy of that, uh, we now know that there's some increased risk of, of uh, Parkinson's disease. And um, as I said, it's about four to five percent of people with Parkinson's disease uh, have that gene. And um, we've also appreciated from a number of studies that if you have uh, one of those genes and you have Parkinson's disease, your risk of, of having some uh, cognitive decline uh, is increased. Um, so uh, so that's, that gives rise to this third idea about, about um, the GBA-associated gene uh, being important for, for this. So <clears throat> the last uh, point that I want to make is, you know, what research is, is currently underway. And, and as I said a moment ago, I'm going to make reference back to these, these three different theories, right? So I, I just laid out three different ideas about um, what might be underlying cognitive decline in Parkinson's disease. And those three ideas, uh, one of them is that there's a spread of the Parkinson's pathology, this Lewy body, which is made of alpha-synuclein, that's one idea. Another idea is that it's, it's, a, it's not the Parkinson's changes per se, but it's the co-occurrence of Alzheimer-like changes, particularly these things called neurofibrillary tangles, and they're composed of something called tau, uh, and then the third idea is, you know, is there something related to this gene that has been relatively recently discovered, this GBA gene? Okay, so those are the three theories I laid out uh, in the last couple of minutes. And what I'm going to describe in our last few uh, minutes of the uh, lecture are research that's underway directed at each of those uh, three things. All right, so I'm going to start with some research that's underway to try to interfere with this spread of Lewy bodies or spread of abnormal alpha-synuclein. Um, so what's, what's thought to happen here is here, this, this is a, a picture of a brain cell on the left here. And these yellow circles here, these are sort of the Lewy bodies, the alpha-synuclein. And what we think is happening in Parkinson's disease is that the sick brain cells are releasing some of that alpha-synuclein and it's going to other brain cells and making them sick, and that's how it's spreading throughout the brain. Uh, so that's on the left. This is showing what, what we think is happening in Parkinson's disease. What, what is being attempted with this research is to use antibodies, and the antibodies are represented by these little green Y-shaped figures here. So these are antibodies that have been uh, uh, developed to really uh, grab a hold of, of the, the Lewy bodies, the alpha synuclein, and get them uh, out of the system so that this um, first sick cell can't make other cells sick, okay? It's really, um, uh, it, it seems like it's, it's far-fetched, but there's actually very good evidence um, from both animal studies or from animal studies that it works. Uh, and there's now been uh, an initial phase study, a phase one study has been completed, uh, and it's gonna be published within the next month, I think. So you might see that coming out in the news in the next month. Uh, and, and now it's moved to a phase two study, uh, which uh, the, the acronym is Pasadena. And this study is currently looking for, for participants. Um, the, the, the thinking is that this uh, strategy will work best in people with very early Parkinson's disease. The idea is to try to stop it in its tracks and keep it from progressing. So uh, participation is confined to people who have had Parkinson's disease for no more than two years uh, and people who are not yet on symptomatic therapy with carbidopa, levodopa, which is Cinemet, uh, with Ropinirol or Requip or Pramipexol or, or Mirapex. And uh, the patients have intravenous infusions uh, every month uh, for 12 months. Uh, and then uh, we're going to learn whether this actually slows the rate of progression uh, or not. Um, uh, this is um, one of two uh, studies uh, of this strategy. There's another um, uh, antibody being developed by a separate company. Uh, that one is actually uh, underway in Seattle. It's not uh, going on in Portland, but, um, but it's a very promising strategy and, and really uh, a potentially a game changer in the way 
we treat Parkinson's disease and, and prevent uh, progression. So this idea about using antibodies uh, is also being applied uh, with respect to the second um, uh, mechanism that I described to you, uh, the, uh, the Alzheimer type changes. So those, those neurofibrillary tangles are composed of something called tau, T-A-U, uh, and the same idea is here. So these, these red bars inside of this brain cell are abnormal forms of tau. Uh, they are thought to be released by the brain cells and taken up by other brain cells, making them sick. Uh, and if you make antibodies directed now against tau instead of against alpha-synuclein, same idea, you can prevent the spread of the abnormal uh, material and keep the brain cells uh, healthy. So, so this strategy is also being uh, tested in clinical trials. Um, I know for this audience, you, you, you would like to hear that we had a trial for Parkinson's disease. Um, that's not quite there yet, um, but there is a trial of one of these antibodies for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the same antibody is being studied in a, a Parkinson's-related disorder, and, and maybe that'll be relevant to some of the uh, listeners here, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP, and, and both of these are, are open to enrollment. Okay, so, so that's, that's these first two mechanisms, and that's these, these, these uh, uh, trials that are underway. Uh, now, the last one is this GBA-associated uh, idea, and uh, here I want to introduce um, um, some pictures that one of uh, our partners uh, took to illustrate the idea of precision medicine. Now, you, you may have heard of precision medicine in cancer. Um, a lot of cancers now are being treated by um, uh, sort of tailoring the therapy to the tumor or to the patient. Uh, sometimes some genetic testing is done to um, uh, pick out the, the right um, uh, therapy. Uh, and it's it sort of illustrated in this, this nice figure that the traditional approach is, you know, we, we say somebody has Parkinson's disease, but uh, as you can see in all these different colors, that's a very mixed group of people. Uh, and they, they all have the signs and symptoms of the disease. And the traditional treatment is we try to give them all the same pill. Uh, and the problem is it, it might help some people. So like these, these people who are, are depicted as blue individuals might respond to the pill with a good benefit, uh, but some people won't have any benefit uh, because they have different traits and some people might have adverse uh, effects. So that's, that's sort of our traditional approach uh, in medicine. And this new approach that, we, that um, people are trying to develop is uh, to take people uh, with a, a given risk and then to um, divide them into different groups, uh, for example, according to genetic testing. Uh, and, then, and then they would have therapies that are directed according to uh, uh, their, their uh, specific uh, characteristics, in this case, specific uh, genetic characteristics. And then hopefully you would see benefits uh, in all cases because you'd be tailoring, tailoring uh, the treatment to the person. So uh, this idea of precision medicine really doesn't exist uh, in neurology yet, but um, uh, the um, existence of this uh, GBA gene in association with Parkinson's disease has led us to think that, that maybe, you know, when I say us, the, the larger medical community, that maybe this could be applied uh, in Parkinson's disease. So the trial that's underway right now involves uh, genetic testing for the gene. Um, so. Uh, the first step is a person has Parkinson's disease. They express an interest in the study, and then they get tested for the gene. If, if they don't have the gene, uh, they're not eligible for this specific study. But then if, if they do have the gene, then they become eligible for a treatment. And, and the reason that the treatment is confined to this group is that the treatment is directed at, at the way that that gene works. So people who participate in this study are going to be taking a pill that targets the gene, uh, they'll be compared with people on placebo, uh, and then after a year, we'll compare the treated people versus placebo, uh, and we'll see if this slows down the rate of progression of Parkinson's disease, including the rate of progression in, in, in cognitive changes. So um, so those those are some examples of, of research that really is, is already in, in clinical application. This is, um, uh, you know, years and years of work leading to a, a clinical uh, study here and elsewhere. So um, <clears throat> the last couple of points I want to make are, are that, you know, sometimes people want to know, how do I find out what clinical trials are available? And th there's a couple of different resources. One of them is this uh, website, clinicaltrials.gov. 
Uh, it's managed by the National Institute of Health, so it's unbiased. It's not connected to any drug companies or anything like that. And what you can do is, is uh, call up the website, and then you can um, uh, just punch in uh, under the condition. You can punch in Parkinson's disease. Um, you can select, you can look at all the studies, but you're probably going to want to select recruiting uh, studies uh, or studies that are going to recruit in the future. And then under other terms, if you want to just find the ones going on in Oregon, you can just write Oregon or Washington or, or, or whatever it is that you want to look for. So it's, it's a, a very comprehensive way to see what's going on. Another uh, source is the Fox Trial Finder, uh, maintained by Michael J. Fox Foundation. In this case, they look for, whoops, um, they, they ask you to fill out more information uh, about yourself. Uh, it's a little less comprehensive, I, I have found, but it is um, uh, a great resource and a great way to uh, help you find uh, trials and help the trials uh, find you. Uh, and then um, uh, we also have clinical trials at OHSU. This is a, uh, an email address that you can uh, send your inquiries to if you're interested in, in seeing what's going on at, at, at OHSU uh, per se. So, um, so that I think uh, covers the, the topics that I laid out for you at the beginning, these, these four topics. And just to sort of recap these recommendations uh, for things that are already available, uh, I, I basically gave you 10 points, right? The first seven are these life simple seven then depression, sleep, and an evaluation of your medications comprise a 10-point plan that, that can be executed uh, in the here and now. Uh, and then in terms of uh, uh, research underway, uh, we've just gone through these uh, uh, examples here. So um, I went a little beyond my 45 minutes, but I think I'm in, in pretty good shape to uh, take some questions. Um, I don't see any further comments from Melissa in the in the chat box here. Maybe you can. Um, oh, here we go. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, one question uh, is: uh, Is eating more fat good for the brain, such as olive oil and coconut oil? Um, um, you know, there's good fats and there's bad fats. Uh, olive oil um, tends to be a good fat. Um, coconut oil, I know there's been a lot of um, uh, anecdotal uh, information about uh, cognitive improvements, um, but cognitive, uh, coconut oil is not uniformly a good fat, so um, uh, I, I guess I wouldn't push that. Uh, the, where, the, the place to find out information about fat content to your diet, again, is the uh, AHA website. The diet section is, is really very nice. Uh, second question is, how do I find a speech-language pathologist who works with uh, people with Parkinson's on cognitive function and memory? Um, um, uh, let's see. So, so well, well, at, at OHSU, we have two people who specialize in that area. Um, um, I, you know, I don't know specifically each of the other hospital systems, whether they, they, they have that, but... Uh, uh, I would imagine between PRO and between OHSU, we could try to uh, identify people who, who uh, would be appropriate to help with that, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I, um, I might suggest you start with PRO, who will have a better sense of, of the rest of the community. I hope I'm not putting anybody on the spot there. Uh, and, um, uh, but we could start to uh, look into that uh, as well from, from our perspective at OHSU. Um, okay, so Melissa is asking me to put down the, uh, whoops, the email for OHSU. There it is. Um, I went through that quickly. Uh, and then uh, again, um, you know, I'll, I'll also, uh, I'll leave that up for a few minutes. I'm going to go to the other two sites as well that are comprehensive and would give you uh, resources beyond OHSU. I'm going to come back to the to the questions that Melissa sent me in advance, um, and and I'll try to go through all of them. Uh, uh, some of them I'm not going to be able to answer. Um, one is, what are the expert opinions on the frequent use of infrared saunas? Um, uh, I, I don't have any opinion on um, uh, infrared saunas with respect to cognitive change uh, per se. Um, there is some interest. Uh, you know, some basic science research on infrared radiation and, 
and brain function, but there's no clinical data at, at the moment. So I, I don't think I would um, uh, be able to comment on any clinical data there. Secondly, is there anything that can be done to help prevent from diminishing any further or even reversing some of the current cognitive loss of symptoms? I, I think that's pretty well uh, covered uh, in the material that I um, uh, presented about the sort of 10-point plan um, uh, and then also the use of speech and language pathologists. Um, so I, I, um, I think that one is, is addressed. If you haven't done so already, please explain how cognitive loss is treated differently with young onset as opposed to diagnosis in older populations. Um, <clears throat> that, that's a good point. So, um, um, you know, I, I don't know that it's treated, that the cognitive loss is treated differently in the, in the two populations, but there certainly are um, differences in sort of the um, implications of cognitive uh, loss. Um, for example, you know, if we have a younger person who's in a cognitively demanding uh, profession, you know, even a little bit of cognitive loss can can be very um, significant. Uh, I, I think the principles are, are the same in that, you know, we focus on diet, activity, and medications. We may um, be even more aggressive about medications with a younger person who is trying to remain uh, in the workplace and, and might have some... Um, um, uh, you know, very minor problems caused by medications that can be improved uh, a little bit. But um, um, aside from that, I don't think I would point to any <coughs> um, particular um, difference in the treatment. Uh, you know, I will say that uh, one of the puzzles in, in the research so far has been that people with uh, young onset um, uh, uh, don't seem to be as at high a risk of cognitive loss as people with older onset, which is, is um, uh, if you think about it, not in keeping with some of the hypotheses that I laid down there for you. But, um, but on the other hand, that's good news for people with, with younger onset that there might be a little bit uh, um, of a, a difference in sort of the natural history of the disease. Uh, there's another question that I'm afraid I, I can't help with. Is the lollipop tool that is being researched in Penn on the market yet? I, I, I don't know that um, uh, information. Uh, the next one, please talk a little bit about the idea of waiting to take medication with PD, both the pluses and the minuses. So um, uh, uh, I'm going to confine my, my answer to the implications for cognitive uh, function, since that's the focus here. Um, there really is not um, a good reason uh, with respect to cognitive changes to withhold medication to, to uh, uh, not start Cinemet or not start a, a dopamine uh, agonist. Um, uh, the, the fuller answer to that question with respect to Parkinson's disease in general, I think, is, is outside the limits of, of the time that I, I have right here. Uh, the next one, how can one differentiate between normal aging, forgetfulness, and cognitive loss from PD? Well, um, uh, uh, I think sometimes that's, that's um, a, a, a real challenge. Uh, and uh, one way to distinguish it is, is the problem severe enough that it's interfering with your everyday activities, your ability to function, your ability to balance a checkbook, your ability to take your medications on time, your ability to keep appointments, those sorts of things. If it is uh, at the level of interfering with day-to-day uh, -day function and, and independence, um, then that's probably uh, a little bit beyond uh, normal aging. Um, the other way to differentiate between the two, really, um, uh, it, it, you can't do on your own. So somebody needs to do some testing. Um, you know, both primary care docs and neurologists are, are capable of doing uh, brief tests in the office. Uh, like the uh, Montreal Cognitive Assessment or the Full Steam Mini Mental State Exam. Uh, and those can um, sometimes uh, be enough to tell us the difference between normal aging and cognitive loss uh, that is more uh, significant. Um, but even those sorts of tests sometimes uh, leave us a little bit in the dark. Uh, and then we need uh, some more specialized um, 
uh, and in-depth uh, assessments, and that's usually done by a, a neuropsychologist. Um, uh, so it's, it's, there's several different levels. So you can sort of evaluate on your own, does it interfere with everyday activities? You can evaluate with your you know, regular clinicians with a screening test, but sometimes it, it actually takes going all the way to a, a neuropsychologist uh, for more detailed assessment to make that distinction. Can you recommend a good resource for information on cognitive decline in, in PD? Uh, you know, the, um, uh, I'm sure that, that PRO has, has good information on this, and, and if there's a, a demand uh, for it, we'd be happy to help with uh, developing some more materials along those lines. Uh, the Parkinson's Foundation, formerly the National Parkinson's Foundation, uh, also has some very nice uh, patient-oriented uh, uh, handouts, and you can, um, uh, order them uh, online, and, and uh, uh, they've got a variety of, of good materials that I've used, so um, uh, any of those would be good. Any treatment to retain or regain cognitive abilities? Um, I, I think we've, we've covered them between um, cognitive rehab by the speech and language uh, pathologists, and then the medications that I described, um, I think are the treatments that are currently available. Uh, let's see. Please discuss the relationship between apathy, depression, and cognitive decline. This is a, a, a good question. Um, um, uh, they're all good questions, but I'm, I'm appreciating this one because I failed to cover it in my talk. Um, uh, these three things, uh, apathy, depression, and cognitive decline, can sometimes mask as, as one another. So, um, uh, you know, when we hear about people with Parkinson's disease uh, or, or uh, just other elderly individuals um, and we're, we're concerned about cognitive decline, the family's telling us about cognitive decline, um, uh, almost every clinician is going to have high on their list. Let's make sure it's not, not just depression that is giving the appearance of, of cognitive uh, decline. Um, uh, the, there, there are some differences on, on what we see on, on cognitive testing that helps us to make that uh, distinction. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, with depression, you know, there's often what we call vegetative signs. People don't sleep well, people don't eat well. Um, and, and then, of course, if people are crying and clearly having an overt mood problem, then that really points us to a, a problem with depression. So um, uh, uh, whether it's the primary problem or just coexistent with cognitive decline, uh, we need to treat uh, depression uh, aggressively, but um, uh, I think uh, the questioner is maybe trying to bring out the, the uh, question of how to distinguish between the two, and, um, and those are some of the features that we use. Um, apathy is, is uh, you know, the other uh, symptom that's listed here, uh, and the, the challenge with apathy is apathy can be a reflection of depression, or it can be a reflection of of uh, uh, cognitive decline and dementia uh, per se. So um, apathy is uh, tricky to sort out, and, and I think we use the same rules to um, distinguish whether apathy is related to the cognitive decline per se uh, or to the depression. Uh, and my own feeling is um, uh, if, if, if I'm in doubt, I, I will uh, often recommend treating with antidepressants to see if we can bring about some improvement. Um, um, if it is depression, we all often see a robust response. Uh, if it's not depression, apathy is, is a little tough to, uh, uh, to have much of an impact on. Uh, sometimes medicines like uh, uh, Exelon and Aricept can be helpful for apathy, but I, I wouldn't try to tell you that that's uniform. Uh, the last question that I have listed here is, can cognitive loss be a precursor to dementia and or Alzheimer's disease? Uh, and, and the answer is, is yes, that, that people who have some cognitive decline, people who have, you know, this entity we call mild cognitive impairment, uh, are at increased risk of developing uh, dementia over time. Um, but uh, it's not um, an absolute um, uh, certainty that that's what's going to happen, uh, and I think um, uh, we should take a, a, a can-do attitude to uh, cognitive decline, and that is try to uh, hit it with everything that we've got, as, as I tried to describe in the lecture. 
and, um, uh, uh, and and try to prevent things from from advancing. All right, so I'm I'm seeing um, a couple of other questions uh, uh, from Melissa. So one says, uh, actually, let me I'm going to advance the slides a little bit. So here's the Michael J. Fox. Um, uh, website, if you want to take a look at that, I'll leave that up for a while, and then I'll put the clinical trials up. What about hyperbaric chambers? Um, there is no evidence that hyperbaric chambers uh, uh, improve uh, cognition. No, no compelling evidence. There is no practice parameter that uh, approves of the use of hyperbaric chambers for improving um, uh, cognitive outcomes. Uh, that's in contrast to um, uh, what you'll find on the internet and and what you'll find from people who are trying to sell their services with hyperbaric chambers, but uh, that's the reality. Uh, and then, and then there's a three-word question, which, which uh, I'm not going to be able to answer um, uh, or really do it just. It says, "What about cannabis?" So um, it's kind of sneaky to bring in at the end because that's really a lecture uh, all by itself. Um, cannabis is, you know, obviously a complicated plant uh, with many, many components. Um, uh, as many of you know, people talk about THC and CBD as the two main components. Uh, CBD is all the rage now. It doesn't make you high, but it may be good for the brain in other respects. But the, there is virtually no clinical data uh, on CBD, reliable clinical data. Uh, and even the basic science data is, is relatively limited. So my... Um, uh, approach is that I don't routinely recommend cannabis, and and I, I don't I don't make the recommendation really in any circumstance for Parkinson's disease or cognitive impairments. Uh, as you know, it's legal in the state of Oregon, uh, and if people want to try it, um, they're they're welcome to to try it, and I encourage them to let me know. And I think uh, all of your doctors would like you to let them know if you're if you're using it. But um, I. Um, uh, I'm not recommending it in the absence of evidence uh, and in the absence of regulation for, for what's actually in the preparations that you receive. So it makes it impossible for, um, for me to dose it or, or make uh, very specific recommendations. So um, I, I think uh, that covers all of the questions that I've seen. Um, Melissa, did you want to come on and and close mm -hmm. things out? I... Absolutely. All and right. Thank you, Dr. Quinn. I appreciate you calling the cannabis question sneaky at the end. <laughs> so <laughs> just, just wanting to um, let everyone know, we did have a specialist that talked about cannabis on last year, and I believe that recorded webinar is up on our YouTube page. Um, I can't, it's been about a year, so I can't necessarily say um, if, the, if cannabis and cognitive changes were discussed, but it's, you know, I've encouraged people to kind of take a look at that webinar um, recording if they are interested. Um, so again, thank you, Dr. Quinn, so much. Um, and thank you all for being here today and participating. So again, a video recording of this webinar is going to be available on our YouTube page. Um, and you can find that link on our website at www.parkinsonsresources.org. Um, if you had any burning questions that did not get answered or any further inquiries, please email me at melissa at parkinsonsresources.org. Um, we just want to say real quick, we do have a speech language pathologist that was on the webinar, um, and so there was a question about finding um, finding someone that could help with cognitive changes and maybe memory, and you can go on the American Speech and Hearing Association website and, oh, um, and find someone there. So thank you so much for, um, for that information. Um, and this concludes our webinar broadcast. So thank you again for, for joining us today, and stay tuned for our next webinar. Um, and again, thank you very much, Dr. Quinn. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.